What's up everyone? Adam C. here for Hidden Jackpots. I am in the lovely town of Thorold, Ontario. So we love Thorold. We've actually never been here before, but we are here today to head down to the Karma Chameleon Gastro Pub to check out one of their happy hours events. Today it's featuring Alan Cross. You may know him as Canadian Radio Royalty, 102.1 The Edge, a bunch of other radio stations, some audio books. He's authored he also has a children's book, podcast, The Ongoing History of New Music. I'm interested to hear what he has to say. He's doing a Q&A. We're going to head down there. Let's go. I can't thank you very much for, for coming. How many people have seen me do this before? One, two, that's it. Oh good, okay, so you can probably hear some repeats, but that's fine. Okay, everybody else, let me explain what the situation is. I could show up here with an agenda, something that I want to talk about, but that would be rather arrogant because, well, what do you want to talk about? What is up on, on, on your mind? So I call these things salons. It's an opportunity for people to get together to talk about things that matter to them and to hear into music and radio and technology and music and all that sort of stuff. That's why we're all here. So the opportunity is to hold a discussion with me leading everything. We can talk back and forth. We can talk to each other. We can argue or you know interject at any particular time. The idea is to have a, a fun sort of afternoon for you know, 90 minutes or so where we can talk about things that matter to us in terms of, of music. Got it? And I will do my absolute best to answer all your questions best I can. And if I go off in sort of some Grandpa Simpson stories every once in a while, please forgive me. You probably heard a couple of them, but nobody else has, so good, it takes the pressure off me. Uh, so with all that in mind, who is going to go first? They're all interesting for their very various reasons. Um, I mean, getting to interview Bowie was great because, because, it's, because it's just, because it's Bowie. Long story short, the first time I interviewed Bowie, I was so starstruck that I forgot to unpause my tape recorder. And I have no proof, I have no proof that I spent 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one with David Bowie. And I don't remember much of it because I was completely starstruck by the whole thing. A couple years later, I, I met him again and I explained what happened. And he looked at me in the eye and put his hands on my shoulders and said, well, that was stupid of you, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Noel, Noel or Liam Gallagher are always fun because they are exactly what you expect them to be. <laughs> they are jerks and they don't care what they say. Because the last thing that you want to do is go into an interview with Liam Gallagher and have him be this nice polite boy. No, I want Liam Gallagher. And every time I talk to Liam Gallagher, I've got Liam Gallagher. <laughs> uh, same thing with Noel Gallagher. It's, it's just like, I don't even prepare questions. I just go in and go, hey, what's going on? And here it comes. <laughs> is there any artist or band that you have interviewed that you were like, wow, I was not expecting that? Oh, Either yeah. good or bad. Every time. <laughs> One of the things that you learn doing this is that artists are human beings. And they're, we only know them by their music, by what we see on stage, by what we read about them in magazines. It's when you get them in a room and they just kind of hang out with you that you realize that they're just like normal people except they have an extraordinary <laughs> job. Uh, Robert Smith and the Cure is, is one of those people. Um, the story with Robert Smith was back in 2004, they had an album called Blood Flowers, and I was asked to go to London to interview him for the record. Okay, that's that's really cool. I've never talked to him before. Fly to London, I get on the phone with the publicist, and she says, yes, tomorrow, 2 o'clock, at this at the Hilton Hotel at Gatwick Airport, and you're going to talk to Robert Smith. Okay, we'll see you tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Um, you know, Robert's workday is from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. So the interview will take place at 2 a.m. tonight. 
Okay, that is an interesting part of the story. Get on the train, go out to Gatwick, wait for my turn, and then I'm ushered into a suite that's completely and utterly dark, except for one bare hanging light bulb. And again, it's two, three o'clock in the morning. And I'm standing there at the door, wondering what the hell is going on. And then, from the kitchenette at the back, this thing <laughs> shuffles around. And he's got the hair, the makeup, and the, uh, the uh, high top running shoes that are un unlaced. Hello, my name is Robert. Yeah, I'm kind of, yeah. <laughs> kind of got it. And, and because it was just the two of us, and there was nobody to interfere, interrupt, or anything, we just had, it was just two guys talking in the middle of the night in a hotel room. And you got the sense of Robert Smith, this is really hard to, this is really hard to convey in an interview, but it was, it was Robert Smith, the guy who just happened to write some fantastic songs and help establish God as, a, as an important musical genre. So I, I would say him. Um, Dave Grohl is the nicest human being on the planet. Um, there has never been a situation where I've talked to him that he hasn't been 100% gracious and fun. And he's willing to talk about other things other than music any time. And uh, I'll give you an example. I think Leo was at a studio in LA, and we sort of were kind of got into a discussion. He was saying something, I was disagreeing with it. And uh, it was just kind of some fun magic going back and forth. And I said, okay, you want to arm wrestle over that? He goes, bring it on. <laughs> so I have a picture of me arm wrestling Dave Grohl. <laughs> so again, these are real people. I'll give, I'll give you another one. Um, a number of years ago, I was in LA. Uh, very long story. I have become friends with Courtney Love. And I texted her one Sunday morning asking her, hey, I'm in town, what you doing? She just come up to the house. So I went up to her house in the Hollywood Hills, and we watched CBS Sunday morning together, <laughs> and uh, eating, eating Pop-Tarts, and I have a cat in my lap, and then on the, on the, uh, on the mantle is that, it's a picture, there's a blonde-haired guy, a little girl, and a pony, and her, and I realized it's a family picture of her courting with Francis. And so again, I got a, a, an inside view as to you know what her wife was like, just a human being. So the easiest interview in the world is Bono. That's just, this is how a Bono interview goes. Been, there's never been any deviation from this. Bono comes in, sits down in front, in front of me. Hello, hello. And my first question is, what's up? <coughs> and he starts talking, and talking, and talking, and talking. I don't get another question in, he just talks and talks. And it's so wonderful to listen to because he's got the soul of an Irish poet. He's very articulate, he's very poetic, he's very thoughtful, he's very, very creative with his use of words. And he will talk uninterrupted for 45 minutes. In fact, I will tell you that there has never been a situation where we have been having an interview and someone hasn't come in from his people, grabbed him by the arm, and dragged him to the door to where he had to be next. <laughs> and as he's being dragged to the door, he's still talking. <laughs> so, uh, okay, wait. Uh, in the corner there. Is there an artist that you have an interview that you really want to? Well, I should have interviewed Elton John. Uh, I have no uh, no Rolling Stone interview. I have no Pink Floyd interview. And the reason is, is I was busy doing all the alternative stuff, and at the time, my colleague was Jeff Woods, and he was the guy doing all the classic rock stuff. So he got those interviews. Uh, I did not. Um, at one point, I would have even taken Charlie Watts as an interview. But no. So no Rolling Stones, no Elton John, and uh, no Pink Floyd. That's, that bothers me. So. Oh, Depeche Mode, yeah, I've talked to them a bunch of times. Uh, they're very quiet. Very, very quiet. Uh, Dave Gone is, is uh, and that is how you pronounce his name, because I've asked him. It's Gone. Really? It's not Gahan, it is Dave Gone. I got that straight from Dave Gone. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Josh Homme, that's how he pronounce his name. How do you pronounce his last name, Josh? Homme. Okay. Not Josh Holm. Brody Dahl, it's Brody Dahl, not Dolly. So, yes.
and it's David Bowie, not Bowie or Bowie. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've spoken to Martin, I've spoken to Andy, I've spoken to Dave, and they're all very nice guys, very reserved, but also uh, quite shy. And you know, you have to really work hard at getting the answers out. And I don't know if it's if it's shyness or if it's just we're not comfortable talking. They don't want to talk. Well, I, I would say you're right that they don't want to talk because um, I'm involved in a documentary that, uh, that, that will tell the story of CFNY, the spirit of radio days, from 1977 to 1992. We spent all last year traveling all over the world interviewing artists to be part of this particular documentary. We went to Depeche Mode five times. Two of those times, they were in Toronto. You know, you know. The concerts too, like if you're in the first second row, no. they don't shake their hands. No. They won't sign your no. albums. Nothing. You know, we, the CFMI broke Depeche Mode in North America. We were a really important part of their career. And no matter what avenue we tried, through management, through the record level, no, not even a response. So. I don't have one, and the problem is, no, I'll tell you why. Because I listen to music all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I get <clears throat> to my office at 7.30 in the morning in my basement, and I'm listening critically and analytically to music all day. So at the end of the day, I'm spent, yeah. and I will either sit in silence, or my, my, my current brain drain thing just to reset my my my, my head is um, I'll sit in the evening and go through reruns of Rick and Morty. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God, that's all I've been doing is watching Rick and Morty. Yes. Is there any music that gets you excited? Or like, oh yes. Oh, there, there's. I find like when you get older, it's like it always seems like. Especially since you have so much knowledge of music. That's the like problem. You see so many, like, oh, this is just a copy of the Smiths. I don't know if you heard last week's program, which was called it, What a Drag It Is Getting Older Musically. And this is what happens. Everybody, okay, this is how we'll end things. I'll explain what has happened to you and what is going to happen to you. Uh, when, you when you are young, uh, there is a period of time, usually between the time you get into high school and the time you get into the real world. Maybe you graduate from college, maybe you just get into high school and then have to go into the real world. During that time, you have all the time in the world for music. You use music to figure out who you are. You use music to project who you are to the rest of the world. You have time, you have money, you have interest. It's, and everything is new to you. Everything is new. You just, you're just a, 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 a vacuum cleaner for everything that comes along. Get out to the real world in your mid-20s, and uh, life starts to intrude. You got a job, you got a, you know, debts, you got a, family, you got kids, you got a boss that hates you, you know, all this sort of stuff. And you find out that you just don't have as much time to devote to music as you used to between, say, 14 and 24. As you get a little bit older, you start thinking, you know what, today's music doesn't sound anywhere near as good as it did when I was a kid. What's wrong with kids today? By the time you get to 33, you are probably thinking, you know what, I've given up on new music. I'm just going to go back and listen to the stuff that I always listen to because it makes me feel good. At age 41 and a half, something happens in your head. <laughs> and you have this midlife crisis, and you go, wait a second, I'm still cool, I'm still down with the kids. And you spend the next 18 months trying to be cool again. At the end of which you go, eh, fuck it, I can't do it anymore. It just doesn't matter. And you go back to those, the music of your youth. The greatest music of your life will always be the music of your youth. Every biological uh, every generation has a biological right to believe that the music they use is the greatest music of all time. So as hard as it is, it is to believe, there's somebody out there that's 15 years old right now that's going to be very, very wistful for Drake and Doja Cat in 40 years, believe it or not. But anyway, so this is, this is what happens. And as you get older, you become more experienced. You, have, you recognize patterns. You recognize cycles. You recognize when something's being recycled. Um, and you just become much more discerning. As a, as a music fan, and that's okay. The problem, though, is that it gets re it gets really, really hard to get that jolt for that you used to get when you were a kid when you heard a great song, which happened all the time because everything was new to you. It's kind of like I think being a heroin addict. 
if you get your first shot of heroin, you get really, really, really high. Then you want more. So the second shot you take doesn't get you quite as high. And then by the time you're a full-blown junkie, you're just taking heroin to survive. So that's what it's like being a music man. And you really you have to up your drugs at, when you're older and experienced in order to get that high that you miss when you wake up. So two things will happen. Number one, you will find a source of music that speaks to you again. Uh, for me, for example, I spent a lot of time listening to BBC Radio 6 because the British do music do, do radio differently and Radio 6 has this thing that there is no such thing as a guilty pleasure. Listen to what you want. This is old, this is classic, this is great. This is something new that you should really listen to because we've listened to a lot of music and it's past our filters. So that's I listen to that a lot. The other thing that you can do is like, okay, every generation has a biological right to believe the music of their youth is the greatest music of all time. What you do is you go back to that era and start listening to stuff that you missed the first time around. So for example, with me, I, lived, because I was at the edge and CFMY, I, I lived the whole grunge thing. And there was all, you know, all the standard grunge stuff. And I still love that alternative music of the early, late 80s to about the mid 90s. I thought that was one of the greatest times of music of all time. That's me. And I realize now that I may be a little bit bored with hearing the same stuff every once in a while, but there's a whole bunch of stuff in that era that I missed. So now I'm going back to that era and digging in, ooh, spiritualized, Spaceman 3, ooh, this is cool. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper and you find some of these things that didn't become part of the alternative canon going forward, but still exist thanks to streaming music services. So that's the cycle of life. At first, you gorge. After a while, you're full. After a while, you're disillusioned. After a while, you want a snack. And then after that, it's like, man, whatever. It happens to everybody, and uh, to varying degrees, and it certainly explains why there's radio stations like Boom and Bounce, because that's the music of uh, somebody's youth, and it's always going to be the greatest music of all time. Just if you have kids right now, remember that uh, in 50 years, they're going to be you know, thinking about how great Drake was. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you intervene now. <laughs> Them something proper. <laughs> yes. Okay, one more here. Hey, uh, I was wondering if you had any uh, bands that were considered one hit wonder bands that maybe had a lot more offers that got flipped under the radar. Well, one, one of the bands that drives me nuts is, is uh, if you look at all the one hit wonder lists, uh, Soft Cell. Yeah. No. Yeah. They had one American hit with Tainted Love, but Soft Cell had a hit still. They're still together, so they're still making records, and there's still some really interesting out there. Gary Newman, another one, with the old cars, right? Or maybe our friend's electric. Go through Gary Newman's catalog, and there is brilliant stuff there. So there's, there are two of my, my recommend, uh, recommendations. Screaming Trees, another one. Tones on Tell, that's so much, because they only released a couple of them. Bauhaus, I know some. So, I heard, a, I thought I heard every single Baja song I'd ever, I, ever, until I heard something on Friday on BBC Six, uh, a song called Fish Cakes. It was a B-side to something. I know that one. Do you? Dan Aykroyd, or no, not Dan Aykroyd, uh, Bill Paxton, whatever the actor, directed the video for it. I, it is just, what? <laughs> there were some serious drugs involved. In <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's Peter Murphy going, fish cakes, fish cakes. <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, thank you for coming today. I hope you have a good evening. Uh, I'm glad we got this in before the Super Bowl. Um, yeah, I know. I don't think anybody's really missing out the Pro Bowl because it's the worst football game of the year. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for the calamari. I'm going to have one more. Happy to do this again some other time because I've got, I mean, we went through two hours here really, really quickly and I still got more. So uh, we'll talk and, and see if we can arrange to do something like this on a brunch. Oh, Sunday brunch is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks a lot, everybody.